thank you very much for inviting me and thank you everyone for coming to listen. I'm very excited to be here also because uh, my research has always been very interdisciplinary, uh, but uh, I don't find a lot of opportunities to talk to different audiences. So today I'm excited to be able to uh, talk to you and I, I'm also looking forward to your comments and your questions in the tutorial. And I hope that this will be uh, something that uh, will be useful for my research as well. So our uh, lecture is entitled Diasporic Literature Between Adaptation and Resistance, Camilla Shamsi's Home Fire. Uh, in my research, uh, I have come to think more and more uh, about the relationship between adaptation and resistance, especially in related to postcolonial literature and diaspora literature, not as, uh, not as a tension between a need to adapt and uh, the, ne the necessity to resist, but more and more as a dialectic that is formative on both sides. So actually in this title, there is a bit of a pun, a word play on the word adaptation, because whenever we think of diaspora, we think of the need to adapt, to conform, uh, which is in tension with another need to resist, to, uh, to have a claim to be who, who you are, to, to have a claim on your identity. However, in, in literature, adaptation is not necessarily uh, a call to conform, uh, to adapt to a situation, but it goes hand in hand uh, with resistance because it can be, and I hope to show, show in this lecture that adaptation itself can be and is for many writers today or many theater people today, a form of resistance itself. Uh, Sorry. So Home Fire, as I also wrote uh, in the blurb and you have read it, is a contemporary retelling, a contemporary version of Sophocles' tragedy from 442 BCE from the perspective of British Muslims in a post 9-11 world and in relation to UK's anti-terror laws, especially denaturalization, which is in this uh, in this novel, uh, revoking of British citizenship, particularly when an individual <coughs> joins ISIS. Uh, I wanted to remind a little bit of Sophocles' Antigone. And Antigone is the uh, daughter of notorious Oedipus, uh, who has been haunting modernity uh, as well, not only antiquity, but also modernity as well. So as you see, uh, Oedipus had four children and after he died, somehow cursing his sons, the sons were engaged in a battle for power. Eteocles at the time of the battle was the king of Thebes, uh, whereas Polynices had a similar claim on, uh, on the city. So he joined forces with Argos and he attacked Thebes. At the end of this war, which resembles very much uh, our understanding of a civil war today, the sons of Oedipus, Eteocles and Polynices, killed one another and Creon, their uncle, became the new king. And he uh, published an edict saying that Eteocles as king will be uh, given a, what we would today might call a state funeral uh, with full honors, whereas Polynices is a traitor and his body will be read, uh, will be left to rot in front outside the city walls. So he wouldn't be admitted into inside the city walls. And he would not, not, not only be admitted into the city, but also he would be refused burial. So uh, as you can see, it's very easy to draw a parallelism between Polynices and all the people who are accused with charges of, uh, being enemies of the state today. So that's why uh, in the epigraph of Shamsi's novel, uh, there is an allusion to Shimas Heaney's version of Antigone called A Burial at Thebes, where he says, the ones we love are enemies of the state. So this is where we start from in Home Fire as well. 
But what happened after this proclamation was that Antigone, one of the sisters, decided to bury her brother, did not obey the edict, and symbolically performed funeral rites on the body. Uh, and he was punished by Crayon to be buried alive in a cave tomb where she could await her death. However, he was confronted by this wise blind seer Tiresias, and then uh, in the very end, he tried to evade the di dire consequences of his decision by giving the body burial and releasing Antigone, but he is too late. And not only has Antigone committed suicide in the world, but also his very son and Antigone's fiance, Haman, has committed suicide next to her. And upon hearing uh, her son's death, Eurydice, his wife, has also committed suicide. So what he is left with, Creon, in the end, is he is left shattered all alone, having lost all his family. So Camilla Shamsi was uh, proposed by a theater director in London, uh, Jatendar Varma, to adapt Antigone to talk about the plight of uh, British Muslims in the UK today. And she could immediately see the re resonance and the, uh, the play talked to her immediately, but she thought that she could only do it in the novel form because she is a novelist. So she changed plans and she changed the medium of expression uh, from a play into the novel. And she also asked herself some questions uh, in reworking the tragedy. So the first one is thought like, okay, we can't have this today. You can't leave a body, let's say, just like uh, outside London, even only for hygiene purposes. But what would be the contemporary equivalent of prohibiting a burial? And then uh, in thinking about the recent political developments, she said, like, what does this mean? It means to say in life or in death, you have no claim over this land. And then she could see the resonance with the home, uh, home office decision of revoking citizenships of dual nationals or naturalized citizens when they act against uh, the interests of the United Kingdom and without a public hearing. So these people cannot even defend themselves. And so uh, to, be, to be banished in life or in death. And secondly, she asked the question as a diaspora writer herself, as an immigrant in the UK who had recently got her citizenship and was feeling more at ease like she was maybe for a very long time for the first time she was feeling secure and then in the news there is this uh, decision that you know uh, okay you're a citizen but we have the right we preserve the right to revoke your citizenship anytime so there is this double tiered idea of citizenship where some people are citizens forever but for some people they will always uh, feel vulnerable at some point. It will always be contingent upon uh, other things. So what she did is that she asked herself uh, a question. She said, like, in all the countries that I have li lived, there has been there has been a tie time when we could evade unwanted consequences, but something happened, or some, uh, something didn't happen. We kept silent. We didn't act when we had to act and things really got out of hand. So how do we come to that moment when the consequences will be inevitable? What do we do or not do and keep silent so that we can no longer evade unwanted consequences? So the example of Creole like, want, uh, wanting to, um, wanting to uh, stop the tragedy from coming in the very last minute, but he's too late, was a good example to think this pivotal moment in history that Shamsi felt herself and like all, all of us in, uh, in that moment when this uh, alleged war on terror turned <clears throat> against the country's uh, own citizens. And how did she do it eventually in terms of uh, the plot structure? So the novel centers around the tragedy of a second generation Pakistani Muslim family and their uh, particularly their children. So there are twins, 19 year old, Anika and Parvez, 
The twins are raised by their elder sister, Isma, when their mother and grandmother die. The father was always an absentee father who was a jihadist, and eventually he was killed uh, on, on his way from, uh, he, was, he, um, he was in a prison in Bagram, Afghanistan, and he was killed on the way to Guantanamo, and nobody knows exactly how. And recently, the brother Parvez has joined ISIS in Syria. So in the background, what Shamsi did to, uh, to the story of Antigone is that in Antigone, you have this story of incest. And related to in incest, you have a very strong feeling of shame in the background. So what uh, Shamsi did is she took this sentiment of shame, but she didn't repeat the pattern of uh, incest because she, she found uh, she found it not, perhaps a little bit at odds or maybe uh, a bit outdated uh, concerning her own point of emphasis in the novel. So she replaced it with the st story of jihad who provides the family with a father who they are ashamed to tell um, the story of. So you still have this sentiment of shame, but in a very, very con uh, contemporarily politicized way. The novel uses free indirect discourse, which is sometimes confused with uh, stream of consciousness technique in which you just like jump into the minds of the speakers and you follow their patterns of thought. Free indirect discourse is kind of different. You have the perspective of uh, one character, you have the character as a focalizer to your narrative, but you are not actually inside. You, you do not have full access to the interiority of the individual, but you have some form of access to the perspective of the individual. So for example, uh, when a comment is made, you know that this comment is not like the writer's or the narrator's comment, but this, this comment comes from the character that has that is being fo uh, focalized at that moment. So we have five characters, and the narrative switches between their perspectives. The first, uh, and these characters all correspond to a character in uh, Sophocles' Antigone as well. So Isma is like Ismene, the sister with the common sense, but here she is the elder sister, not the younger sister. And after uh, looking after and raising her siblings, she now decides at the opening of the story, she has taken the decision to live her own life. So she is leaving for a PhD in sociology in Massachusetts, US, but she is stopped for interrogation at the airport in, uh, at Heathrow. So on page one, immediately, uh, we are in a very politicized uh, environment. And um, the interrogation starts with like very strong racial profile, uh, profiling and uh, she, she is scared, she is anxious, she doesn't know if she will be allowed to board a plane. She knows that she is going to miss her plane, but she, she is not even sure if she will be eventually able to go. So uh, from page one, we are introduced into the anxiety uh, the second generation immigrant feels uh, because she belongs to a Muslim culture and how events outside her uh, have an effect on her immediate daily experience as well. And after she goes to the US, she meets Eamon, where she is a bit in love with, but then it, things doesn't work out. But she knows, she knows Ayman because his father is a Pakistani British politician who is a bit notorious uh, in Wembley, and he his family is also from Wembley, and that's where uh, they know him. But uh, they think that by assimilating into the mainstream British culture. Uh, he has somehow betrayed his own heritage, his own roots uh, for the sake of uh, conforming and has, has put them all in, in a vulnerable position by not siding with them. 
So Isma is a bit reluctant in her relationship with Amon, which is exacerbated when uh, his father, Karamat Lone, is appointed as Britain's first home secretary from a Pakistani origin. And then we also uh, get to understand that the reason of the interrogation and also uh, the reason of a big uh, sadness in the family was Parvez's recruitment by ISIS. And Anika is trying to uh, bring him back safely home and uh, to save uh, her twin eventually. But Eamon returns to the UK only to meet Anika, who is a law student, and they start a relationship together, only to find out in the end that Anika approached him with the hope of being able to help her sister, uh, sorry, uh, her brother, uh, because his father is the home secretary. But they, their relationship has reached such a point that they, they are now literally in love and this love has turned into something much stronger than she has anticipated. But Eamon is shocked to find out about this. And at that moment, the narrative switches to Parvez and we find out how he has been also kind of like infatuated by the recruiter from ISIS, kind of like a father figure that he has never had. And uh, he is, he is kind of duped into uh, a promise of a new country where there will be uh, no discrimination, no racial profiling, where he can, where he can be himself. Uh, and in spite of all the media coverage on the headings and the violence and everything, uh, he wants, he probably wants to believe and leaves for uh, Syria, but he's like very immediately disillusioned tries to escape, manages to escape as far as to Istanbul, and he wants to reach the British embassy in Istanbul and claim a passport for himself. And at that moment, the uh, narrative switches to Anika and her grief because Parvez is killed in Istanbul while trying to reach the British embassy. However, Anika's part is really, really very short and like cut in between by, uh, other forms of media like newspaper coverage, social media, uh, and things like other forms of narrative somehow resembling the chorus in ancient tragedy. And then we switch to Karamat who has revoked uh, Parvez's citizenship and refuses the rep repatriation of his body and claims claims that because he is a dual national with uh, Pakistan, that his body uh, should be buried there. Upon hearing this, Anika is really indignant. She immediately travels to Karachi to start a protest next to her brother's dead body in front of the British Deputy High Commission in Karachi. And in the end, just like Crayon, Karamat is confronted not by a blind seer, but Terry, who is halfway between Tiresias and uh, Eurydice, the, uh, the wife in Crayon's wife in uh, the tragedy, who tells him to set things right. So he makes up his mind, but again, only too late. Amon uh, turns up in Karachi to support Anika, but he is trapped by a man who locks a suicide vest around him. Anika runs. Uh, towards Amon, and the novel ends in the moment when there is this anticipation that uh, the suicide west will blow up, but the lovers just uh, are locked in an embrace, and uh, the narrative ends, leaving the rest up to our imagination. Now I want to switch to this politics of adaptation of like uh, adapting Antigone. So I wanted to start with a definition of adaptation. And I find Linda Hutchins' work, A Theory of Adaptation, very useful in that sense. So very, very briefly, she describes adaptation as an openly acknowledged and extended reworkings of particular other texts. And 
just like Benjamin said, storytelling is always, if storytelling is always the art of repeating stories, adaptations are also about how stories travel. They have this palimpsestuous quality about them. There is always this idea of the former text kind of haunting uh, the newer, uh, historically newer text. But there's also this intertextuality between them, this, uh, this uh, two-sided relationship that not only goes from like this originary text to the new text, but also backwards informing, like for example, in this instance, informing our reading of Sophocles' Antigone as well. So forever changing both. So I think this idea of plurality of texts, this uh, intertextuality brings about a non-hierarchical quality. And uh, Hutchin also says that in adaptations, there's always a creative and interpretive act of appropriation and salvaging. So I, when I think of adaptation, I generally set it aside from appropriation because appropriation kind of um, has this idea of this originary text that is somehow more privileged uh, hierarchically that informs on the, uh, on the adaptation. And also it is somehow forced to conform to new rules. So I think it is very restrictive in both the adapted text and the adaptation itself. But the salvaging quality that is uh, at play in adaptation, uh, I think what happens, especially in adaptations that have a political agenda. Also adaptation can be in any direction. It can involve a change of medium or genre. Like in this example, we have an adaptation from an ancient tragedy to a novel, or even a change of context from antiquity to modern. And also like parodies are also some, uh, are also forms of adaptation. And much has been written on post-colonial adaptations of Greek tragedies, which I think Shamsi's novel uh, is uh, one of them. And these post-colonial, most, what I realized as, um, in my research is that like most of these post-colonial adaptations are also uh, diaspora, works of diaspora literature. And playwrights and authors rework Greek tragedies to, to comment on their own political presence because they find a political relevance uh, with their own contexts. And the, the first question that emerges when somebody, uh, uh, somebody writes an adaptation from a post-colonial perspective is, why do you adapt uh, a canonical tragedy, especially from the Western canon? So um, the question is, can adaptations decolonize the classics? Can adapting classics be a subversive act in itself? Or uh, is it like Audre Lorde's famous question, will the master's tool ever dismantle the master's house? Can you, with a work from the Western canon, ever, uh, ever uh, serve uh, a revolutionary act or something? So the first question is the Western canon. Uh, but what happens is that post-colonial writers generally do not see Greek tragedies as uh, Western, as parts of Western canon. So post-colonial writers who adapt Greek tragedies scrutinize and counter the Eurocentrism at play in the West's appropriation of ancient Greece as their own cultural property. Well, the Western canon itself is, is a quite recent invention, but it's also a carnivore that will appropriate anything that serves its self-image. So today, when we say the Western canon, we not only find the Greek, Greek classics, but also Russian novels or women writers who hadn't been canonized before, much of post-colonial literature, etc. So we, we can expand these ex, uh, examples. And also that the Western tradition somehow canonized Greek tragedies does not mean that they cannot have resonances outside the West. Indeed, in the colonized world, uh, they were even like, uh, du during the colonial uh, education system, they were somehow seen from free from colonial stigma because of their somehow like strange un-Englishness. 
and many uh, many theater, theater practitioners preferred Greek tragedies over British tragedies. Like, for example, they wouldn't adapt Shakespeare because uh, they saw, well, of course, there are many, many exceptions to this, but uh, that there, especially in Africa, there was this idea of, uh, of um, a rejection of British literature. But somehow, Greek tragedies, because of their the because of this feeling of un-Englishness, were somehow seen as an uh, exception. And also, uh, even though they were part of the colonial curricula, uh, they they were not they were not equated with uh, works of British literature. Likewise, Camilla Shamsi says, I don't think Antigone is part of the Western canon. And to support her argument, she says, you know, this myth has traveled to India long before the British Empire during the time of the Indo-Greek kingdoms. Well, I, even, even if it didn't travel, uh, I think uh, this, uh, this questioning of the Western canon is in itself um, like the decolonizing Greek tragedy, like a decolonizing Greek tragedy uh, movement is, uh, is an important aspect of uh, many post-colonial adaptations. So uh, another work I find very useful is The Politics of Adaptation, Contemporary African Drama and Greek Tragedy by Astrid van Weyenberg. So I tried to summarize what are the possible politics at play in adaptation. So in this work, Van Weyenberg does not try to determine the politics of adaptation, but she talks about possible politics that might be at, at work. So she says, okay, writers uh, turn to Greek tragedies to comment on the political present, and by offering Greek tragedy as theirs, they also undermine Eurocentric claims to ownership and authority. And also adaptation is not a historically linear and unidirectional relationship in which the pretext remains an authoritative source that somehow oppresses the new text. But we, we can think of it, we can think of all these texts as constellations in which different texts, contexts, and traditions relate to one another non-hierarchically and simultaneously. And Greek tragedy has been part of the uh, colonial education, uh, colonial curricula. And in the past, it was used to legitimize British dominance, that's true. But this also means that these works are not external uh, to these authors' cultures, but, that have, but they have been uh, part of their education. And hence, they are part of their own culture as well. One theory about uh, adapting uh, canonical works is the idea of canonical counter discourse coined by Helen Tiffin to refer to adaptations as primarily as ways of writing back to the empire as anti-colonial strategies and dismantling Eurocentric literary hegemonies. So how does the canonical counter discourse work? So by rewriting the characters, the narrative, the context and or the genre of the canonical script, it provides uh, the author with another means of interrogating the cultural legacy of imperialism and offers renewed opportunities for performative invention. These are not however, so this is also what Shemsi does in a way. These are not however strategies of replacement. There is no attempt to merely substitute a canonical text with its oppositional reworking. Counter discourse seeks to dis deconstruct significations of authority and power exercised in the canonical text to release its stranglehold on representation and by implication to intervene in social conditioning. I also think that by rewriting Antigone, Shamsi is, uh, is also engaged in a similar gesture. So by, 
so she is also countering any uh, any interpretation which kind of like for, for example antigone has been a work taken up with take, taken up by philosophers uh, like hegel and in psychoanalysis by lacan but she's generally seen as an ethical agent and for example in uh, hegel's reading uh, kind of puts equal emphasis on the figures of antigone and crayon and sees them as uh, as equally valid uh, parts of an argument. Like according to Hegel, Crayon is right, but Antigone is also right. And there is this clash between them. However, in these immediately political, politicized adaptations, you don't have the same dynamic. So they, uh, they immediately, like the way Shamsi does, they immediately shift the center of gravity within the text itself to scrutinize the forms of power that throughout like um, the Western tradition of thought uh, has been legitimized in a way. However, Astrid von Weyenberg is, hum uh, is critical of this idea of the canonical counter discourse because she says the idea of writing back to the canon could end up reaffirming the canon's originary location in the West. And it kind of makes uh, these, so she's writing about theater plays. She says it makes these plays uh, look like their primary function is uh, decolonization, but there's so much more to it. So how does Shamsi adapt Antigone? So my simple answer would be strategically. I think she does it quite strategically. And uh, she is also, uh, e even though she thinks, and I agree with her, that Antigone is not part and parcel of what is defined as Western canon, but still she, use, she uses the legitimation, acceptability, and the historical validity of uh, being part of a canon of canonical traditions. Adaptation by providing an accepted form helps carve out an epistemic space for suppressed narratives. So taking out the established plot structure of a classical tragedy to hold out as a parable to a contemporary problem is I think what she does here. So she, she uses Antigone as a parable to scrutinize what it means to be a citizen and to belong in the UK today. And by doing this, she immediately changes the rule of the game, as I said, by shifting the center of gravity within the text. So she is not just up updating or modernizing Antigone, but she is definitely changing the central conflict or problematic at the heart of the tragedy. So instead of the simple burial issue, we now have another question that is equally relevant here. It is this question that she asked, uh, and I read before, how do we come to that moment when the consequences will be inevitable? So this adaptation provides Shamsi with a tool for resistance in the discursive field. So to go back to the politics of the novel, the starting point is Teresa May's sentence, citizenship is a privilege, not a right. So in the novel, there is a, a Pakistani Muslim uh, Home Secretary Karamat Lone, as like uh, he is a Tory politician, and the novel was published in 2017, uh, and it was quite, in that sense, uh, foreshadowing the appointment of Sajid Javed in 2019, uh, who revoked a lot of citizenships. We can I can show you the chart that shows that the uh, the radical increase in the number of uh, revocations between 2016 to 2017 and by the time of uh, Javed's appointment the numbers were much much higher and also uh, I'm sure you have talked about this a lot uh, during during the semester but he has also revoked Shamima Begum's uh, citizenship and as you know so I have put three recent uh, news articles here 
So the one about Begum, uh, I found it, well, I, I could spend another hour talking about this news in the Telegraph because it, uh, it says, exclusive pictures Shamima Begum seen in Western clothes as she, as she seeks break with uh, IS past. So we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but uh, I, I have to stick with Shamsi, but I have to say that she has been a source of inspiration uh, for her novel. And uh, she has actually written about her uh, in The Guardian as well. Another recent news was the UK considering send, sending not only uh, the, peop the people whose citizenship status they have revoked away in their neo colonies, but also asylum seekers abroad to be processed, just like they are sending their unwanted plastic uh, outside uh, the UK and Europe. So it's, I think it kind of, uh, it kind of corresponds to an idea of a very disturbing actually idea of a human waste uh, and an understanding of somehow what, what I might call neo-colonial dumping. So in the novel, it finds expression in two times when Karamat, as he is uh, drinking his coffee from a paper cup, he sends uh, the paper cup flying in the direction of the rubbish bin. It hits the rim, bounces up, plummeted into the receptacle. And then he thought, take out the trash, keep Britain clean. So it's, uh, it's really significant because at this moment, he's thinking of the revoking of citizenships. So at that moment, he immediately associates the process with keeping Britain clean. And then uh, Anika's cousin uh, accuses Anika of creating a scene in Pakistan. And then at that moment, he says, and then your government thinks this country can be a dumping ground for its unwanted corpses. So when citizenship becomes a privilege instead of a basic human right, it creates a human waste to be transported uh, to neo colonies, I said. And this starts from its former colonies and extends to what they call poorer countries or developing countries or whatever euphemism they like. And for example, Turkey, uh, my country of origin has, all, has already been serving as a limbo for asylum seekers today. And I cannot imagine how worse this condition could get. So now I want to move on to diasporic themes in Home Fire, who uh, might be more of an interest for you. And this uh, discussion around citizenship opens up the question of belonging that we see a lot in diaspora literature. So there's a lot of border crossing. It starts in Heathrow Airport, goes to Massachusetts, US, then back to London, then from London to Istanbul and Raqqa, and back to Istanbul, back to London, and then to Karachi. And all the characters are second or third generation immigrants. Almost all of them come from British uh, Pakistani origin, except Ayman, who has a father uh, who is a British Muslim, but also a mother who is an Irish American. So what is home in Home Fire? It's not just the central theme, but it's a central problem. The photo you see in the slide, uh, well, the illustration uh, that you see in the slide is uh, from the time of the uh, World War I, and the name Home Fire comes from the song, Keep the Home Fires Burning uh, during World War I, referring to the role of women to make sure that the homes stay where they are in working conditions so that when their men return, they find uh, that they are welcome back in their homes. So this is quite ironic because in Shamsi's novel, we do not have this. Instead, we have a home who, which is on fire, metaphorically ablaze, burning down on the way to being extinct. The, the woman in the family can no longer uh, wait for uh, their men when they go abroad to fight their jihadist wars. And, um, it's also ironic that the novel opens with the theme of a loss of home. 
so uh, as I said, the novel opens with the loss of home, Isma going to the US, letting out the family home to be able to pay the mortgage. And the twins are kicked outside basically, and they have to stay with their neighbor. And even though their neighbor, Auntie Nassim, is very welcoming, it's still not the way like it feels in their own homes, but there is no way that they can, uh, they can financially sustain their new home. So for finance, it starts with financial reasons, their loss of home. And then the questions that arise from this idea of a loss of home, that is also very characteristic of uh, diaspora novels, is that where do these characters belong? Where is home? Do they have a place of origin to which they can return? Are they, as Karamat Lone claims, actually uh, Pakistani, a country where they have never even visited in their lives, and they just happen to have uh, an identity card. And uh, culturally speaking, they have no idea, they have no feeling of uh, belonging. Or another question, can they relocate in a new home in somewhere new, like Isma does? So this, um, this idea of belonging related to citizenship status also raises the question of Britishness in the novel. Isma is asked, do you consider yourself British in the interrogation? She says, I am British, but do you consider yourself British? So she doesn't know how to reply this question without sounding uh, evasive. And Shamsi says, you know, it's about how some people are unequivocally and irrevocably British, no matter what they do, while for others, it's more complicated. So Isma is a very clever girl. And in, in class, the way she responds to Dr. Shah also talks about how, uh, how these new laws of revoking people's uh, citizenship also rhetorically make people un-British. So she draws attention to the epistemic violence that is created, first of all, rhetorically. So she says, the 7-7 terrorists were never described by the media as British terrorists. So they were either British of Pakistani descent, British Muslim, or my favorite, British passport holders. Always something interposed between their Britishness and terrorism. Likewise, Karamat, Karamat Lon, in a public speech, invites uh, British Muslims to assimilate into the mainstream culture. You are, we are British, he says. Don't set yourselves apart in the way you dress, the way you think, the outdated codes of behavior you cling to, the ideologies to which you attach your loyalties, because if you do, you will be treated differently. So he says, assimilate conform because we because he's he would say probably we because there is no space for your difference so actually the moment i saw shamima begum's photo in her quote unquote western attire uh, which is basically a jumper nothing else a t-shirt and a jumper uh, i immediately thought of uh, this speech by karamat Lone. But here, uh, we do not have the usual diasporic theme of a return to a previous home or the fantasy of a return to somewhere. And uh, even though it is, there is a search for a home, it's central to the novel, the narr narrative is totally decentered. There is no return home. So in this sense, I think uh, James uh, Clifford's ideas in the diasporas are quite relevant when he says that for um, for Asian immigrants, uh, it's, it's not generally shaped by the idea of a return back somewhere, but it's more decentered. It's more about uh, creating, di uh, creating diverse communities uh, wherever they are. So Clifford says, the transnational connections linking diasporas need not be articulated primarily through a real or symbolic homeland. Decentered lateral connections may be as important as those 
formed around the teleology of origin or return as a shared ongoing history of displacement, suffering, adaptation or resistance may be as important as the projection of a specific origin. So this is, I think, what we have here. But in Home Fire, we also see the characters, especially the sisters, insistence on their difference and claim to a right to a home. I could talk more about this, but I don't want to uh, miss out on another part. So I'm moving on. So this search for a home and disillusionment, I said, uh, is central. But where do they belong? My own answer to this question is that they maybe they belong in the UK, but their loyalties do uh, their loyalties are not devoted to even a country. I think I think it lies more in in smaller places. So instead of a country, not even a city. I think it's like their very family home on Preston Road, Wembley, in the north of London. So it's that particular. I think loyalty lies in smaller scale in home fire it lies in the family it lies in the memory it lies in the individual it lies in the body but they look for a home so isma tries to start a new life in the us but she cannot even afford a home that she would like to have and the home that she finds only reminds her of the surveillance that she went through uh, in the airport parvez tries to find a new country. So he is duped by the promise, some, some, something like a promised land, but he's totally disillusioned immediately. There is anti Nassim's house, but you're just a guest there. You don't belong, it's temporary. And Anika looks for a home in the, in the person of Eamon and his Nottingham flat. Similarly, Eamon looks for a home in Anika and the, cult, the cultural heritage that he is being denied by his father but they, they, uh, they are also denied to realize this potential because of the unfolding events. The, loan, uh, the Karamat Loans family home is the only home in the no novel perhaps, but it is also after the appointment, after his appointment as a home secretary, he is also losing his home. There is increased security. There is a panic room. The trees are being cut for, uh, for security reasons. And I think Karamat Lone's home in Home Fire is, uh, is very much a metaphor uh, for the country. After all, he is the home secretary and his home is like, a, is like a projection of the country's state for the sake of increased security. What the country at that moment is giving up is just like uh, the, uh, the Lone family to giving up uh, their feeling of uh, their feeling of belonging, their their homey feeling, their feeling of uh, maybe not state security, but their feeling of being safe in their own skin. So uh, I think uh, Camilla Shamsi is also critical of the way the country, for uh, claims to security, is made to feel more unsafe at that time. As opposed to all these places, there are also a lot of non places, which are also characteristic of uh, diaspora narratives, you have airports, you have interrogation rooms, you have, for example, Istanbul is as a transition point and not as a local in itself, the British consulate in Istanbul, or the uh, high, uh, high commission in uh, Karachi. These are like idealized places like a country that you cannot reach that is supposed to be there but you cannot enter it is like uh, there is always a denial at work so i talked about epistemic uh, violence and this this is also uh, referred as in theory epistemic injustice and this epistemic violence and this epistemic injustice call for uh, epistemic resistance. So why can't there be any re reconciliation with the home on fire? Why can there be no return to the Preston Road home? Why cannot things work out? I think home fire tells us that the injustice the characters are facing here 
are largely initiated by uh, discursively by a system that denies their authentic existence as themselves. There is this uh, part of racism that there's no that gives no discursive space for their own experience of Britishness that also uh, James Clifford talks about a different experience of Britishness, but there is no space uh, within the boundaries of the novel and they are only asked to conform and assimilate. And there is this theme of cruelty, which Anika calls unforgiving, that it doesn't only reject Parvez as a so-called terrorist, but also uh, it, this, the system stigmatizes the whole family and Muslim community at large, and nobody, uh, nobody feels safe. Their narratives are suppressed and they feel like second-class citizens, and this placement becomes the outcome of resistance to such violence. So Gayatri Spiwak was uh, the first person, I think, to talk about um, this aspect of imperialism, uh, epistemic violence. And she said, like, you know, in her very, very famous Kendi subaltern speak, it was not, a, it was, she says, never a problem of if they could speak. The problem is who would listen? And more recently, Miranda Fricker wrote about epistemic injustice in uh, injustice this is, uh, that is distinctively epistemic, consisting in a wrong don done to someone specifically in their capacity as a knower. So testimonial injustice refers, for example, when, uh, when Isma is in the interrogation room and asked, does this jacket belong to you? Meaning, did you steal it? So her, her testimony is, um, is not given credibility because of who she is. And secondly, there is hermeneutical injustice uh, when the interpretive resources of the society uh, make, it, make that person more vulnerable to uh, injustice. It's like, for example, when you suffer sexual harassment in a culture that still lacks uh, the conceptualization uh, of the crime. So in, as I said, in Home Fire, there are many, many instances or when like uh, when Parvez was trying to escape ISIS uh, to go into the British consulate, the press still pre represented him as a potential attacker, even though it was known that he was running away. Or just because she was having a relationship with Eamon, Anika's whole testimony and grief suffers from a credibility deficit. And when she, like in the middle of her grief with her brother's dead body in front of uh, the British uh, High Commission in Karachi, the Home Secretary watches her from his screen and he thinks she's trying to impress the world. He refuses to acknowledge her grief. So Jose Medina also writes about uh, the epistemology of injustice and resistance. And he says, epistemic injustices call for epistemic resistance. So finally, I propose to read Home Fire itself as an act of epistemic resistance. By refusing to conform to the discourse imposed by the state and ins insisting on preserving their own difference, Anika and Isma in their own ways, I think perform acts of epistemic resistance. And this is also a modern take on Antigone's speech acts. So what, what Antigone does in Sophocles' uh, tragedy, she, cannot, she does not like literally bury her brother, but she symbolically buries her brother by pouring some dust on the body and uh, you know, in ancient Greece, pouring libations uh, as part of the funeral practices. But then what, what more she does is uh, Judith Butler writes at length about this uh, in Antigone's claim is that when she is addressing Creon, the king, she says, uh, sorry, Creon says, do you accept or deny that you did it? And she says, I don't deny anything. So for Butler, uh, Antigone's uh, resistance and Antigone's rebellion primarily lies in her speech acts. So she discursively fights back Creon. So I think uh, in Home Fire, uh, the alternative uh, discursive space opened up by Anika and Isma is a similar 
uh, instance. But uh, even though, just like Antigone, Anika rejects her sister's help, here I think uh, there is a, they are more united in spirit as, uh, as Isma prepares to leave in support of her sister just to be on her side. But more than what happens inside the novel, I think this novel itself is, a, uh, is an act of epistemic re resistance and uh, the adaptation itself makes space for it. So by adapting Antigone to make space for the silenced narratives of British Muslims in a post 9-11 Western world, Shamsi's novel performs an act of epistemic resistance. So the politics of resistance offered by the adaptation of classical tragedy is by rewriting Antigone, Sh uh, Shamsi singles out the dynamics of rebellion within an oppressive system. And uh, sh she, she also shows that this has a history as far back as 2,500 years. And here, the ethical, the novel also shows that the ethical is political. As distinctive from philosophical interpretations of the tragedy that I told you about, which read Antigone from an ethical point of view. So for Hegel, she's the ethical agent. For Lacan, she is um, the, she symbolizes the ethics of psychoanalysis. But here, this is immediately political. Adapted from a post-colonial perspective in the diaspora, this adaptation shows how the ethical is conditioned by the political, which constitutes the act of epistemic resistance. Also, Miranda Fricker writes that uh, uh, epistemic injustice, even though it's in the field of ethics, is always immediately political by nature. So I want to stop here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Ekin, thank you very much for this incredibly inspiring lecture which I think has helped us to really, as a last lecture of the term, to rethink so many of the topics we dealt with from a new perspective, from a, a perspective that brought together philosophy, literature, theater, uh, diasporic uh, um, scholarship. So it was incredibly inspiring, incredibly rich, uh, eye-opening. And I think that uh, whoever hasn't read Home Fire <laughs> probably will immediately <laughs> go and buy the book and read it. Uh, and who people who have read it like myself have found so much food for thought in your lecture to rethink the value and the powerfulness and the potential, uh, the unsettling potential of, the, of this incredible novel and of the author. So really, I cannot thank you enough. Um, and I think I am interpreting the, um, um, the students' <laughs> uh, feelings about this as well. And really, thank you again. And uh, see you later uh, at the tutorial at four o'clock. I would also say, I would also like to say thank you to all. I'm also reading uh, the comments in the chat box. Thank you very much for listening to me. And good luck with your PhD as well. Thanks. <laughs>